this, um, would one of you like to talk about uh, the Senior Service Alliance, what it does, how folks can get involved, and um, and then I'll do the same for Positive Aging Sourcebook, and we'll bring on Ada and uh, get this discussion started. I'll be glad to start, and then I'd like my partners to pitch in. Uh, Senior Services Alliance started about three and a half years ago, and we were 10 people. Our master list now has 351 on it as we've grown, expanded. And the goal of our group is to, one, make sure that people meet quality people in their fields, get to know them, uh, because who knows when they're going to need their services. And number two is to educate people. We are booked out through next February with speakers because people want to speak to um, our members. And um, it's been going very well. And anybody can join. Uh, you can contact any one of us and we'll get the link to you. And we're going through some changes right now. We're on a new platform that seems to be working quite well. And we've got some plans to make our group grow uh, even larger and to continue to also work with Steve and Pro Aging, uh, another quality group that uh, we enjoy interacting with. So Gary, Joe, Aaron. No. The, group is, the group is made up of folks that uh, individuals and small businesses that in some fashion provide services to seniors. We're all about making available uh, information and programs that uh, help the senior community. That's what we are. And, and the, the Senior Services Alliance, when you come into the group, it's, it's sort of like a warm hug. So I'm Gary Haynes. I, um, I had started a Senior Service Alliance, coincidentally, in the Anne Arundel County area some time ago, and that's about five year, years ago. And recently in the last year, uh, we and, and this current group decided to meet and we said it was in our best interest to, to join together. And we have done that. So we're regional in nature now, uh, Washington, Baltimore region, Annapolis. Uh, excited to be here with a with the merger, we also decided to do outreach to those who use our services and we'll be getting, beginning that in October. Great. And I'm Erin and I just reflect that the group is a great group to be a part of to learn more about what's going on in our communities serving seniors. Great. Well, thank you, and, and I'm looking forward to more partnership opportunities with you all. For folks that might be in the audience that aren't familiar with Positive Aging Sourcebook, we used to do live meetings uh, for networking, and with COVID, we've made the transition to online and digital meetings. You can see what we've got on the calendar for the rest of the month. Uh, Tomorrow, we got a really good one on devices of de mobility devices. And then on Friday, spotlight on payment options. Um, but every month we have a sponsor. And this month, our sponsor is the Elite uh, Collection by Silverstone and Watermark. And those are three senior new senior living communities in Fairfax, Rockville, and Alexandria. Um, if you're uh, not familiar with Positive Aging Sourcebook, the, uh, you can learn about it at proaging.com. You can see all of our recordings in our event calendar. We got a career center, provider search, and we've got the, uh, uh, if you scroll down to the bottom, you can see all the current editions of Positive Aging Sourcebook. And if you're in the DC metro area, we've got a brand new edition. So if you haven't received it yet, make sure to go to proaging.com or shoot me an email and we'll make sure to get that to you. So, um, I'm really uh, uh, charged up about our topic today. And when Meryl contacted me, I, it feels like it was a year ago. Meryl, you're right. You guys do do a lot of advanced planning um, about this topic. I was like, boy, this is a wonderful, um, uh, a wonderful partnership topic. 
but more importantly, a wonderful speaker, Ada, who um, is from Life Matters. And Ada, um, welcome. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. And uh, let's, uh, let's let our audience get to know you a little bit of, a better. Um, before we jump into your presentation, tell us a little bit about your background and what you do at Life Matters. Hey, Steve, thank you for having me. Thank you, Merle and um, um, Senior Services Alliance for getting me on this platform today. And um, basically, I'm a physician um, who is kind of delved into non-clinical medicine recently, just because, you know, I went ahead and decided I wanted to go to more school. And then I got an MBA and an MHA. So with Life Matters, I'm getting the opportunity to kind of understand the business of medicine. <laughs> you know, and my role here is to kind of bring my clinical expertise to help support the social workers and registered nurses that um, are care managers with the communities we serve. So bringing in that knowledge of healthcare and also the, you know, being able to support them operationally. And it's been a, a very interesting one year so far. Excellent. Yeah. Well, Let's dive into this topic and uh, the um, what I'm going to recommend so that we you, give you the maximum amount of stage of dives is that me and my colleagues at the Senior Services Alliance are going to duck behind the curtain here. Mm -hmm. I want to remind the audience that if you've got any questions, type them in using that Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, when we open it up, you can raise your virtual hand. But uh, really looking forward to a very thought-provoking discussion today, and um, I want to make sure. Okay, good. I got your I got your polls as well there. Okay. Um, Thank you. Okay, so let's um, here we'll put everybody behind the curtain there. Um, and then you can share your screen. Okay. Um, I don't know. Is it working? Uh, I'm seeing your PowerPoint. Okay. Give me one second. Let me start the share again because I want to make sure that I am going to include my, give me one second. Share, no problem. The sound. Okay. And then Joe, I'm not sure if you can turn your camera off here. Actually, I'm uh, let, me, let me do that. Is that what you want? There we go. Great. And um, so are we good now? Is my slide showing? Yep, that's great. Okay, so um, sex and aging. When you hear the word sex and aging, it sounds like an oxymoron because it's like two contradictory um, words because people just feel like, you know, if you're aging, like if you're 60s, 70s, and 80s, 90s, that, you know, Who's talking about sex, you know, at that age? And so that's the reason, you know, why this, this um, presentation we're doing it today is to kind of educate and just let everyone understand that just because you're aging doesn't mean you're asexual. Um, like the cartoon on my screen shows, um, it just shows, I would just call him, I don't know, I don't want to call anyone in the uh, audience. So let's just call him Mr. A is talking to Ms. H. And he's, you know, he's telling her about pole dancing not being what it used to be. And it's, it's a funny cartoon, but it's just a way to kind of like jar our thinking at the beginning of this presentation to understand that there's nothing new under the sun and that seniors know about things we think they don't know about. Just I think is the same way when we think when we're thinking about teenagers thinking like, oh, or young adults. Um, and so um, seniors aren't asexual. Seniors uh, would prefer that we didn't make them feel a certain way uh, if they were trying to express about their sexual lives. And so my objectives today is to, um, let's just share the objectives real quick. My objective is to kind of increase everyone's awareness, you know, of, of any bias they may have to sex and aging. Um, we also want to demystify the myth that older adults are asexual and have no sexual desires. 
want to challenge any assumptions people may have about older adults and sexual intimacy. And, you know, I just want everyone to leave here being empowered either for themselves or for um, people they serve or even for family to kind of advocate for seniors who desire sexual intimacy and to kind of help advocate as well so that we can prevent um, sexually transmitted infections, which happen even in seniors. Um, so that's the aim today. It's gonna to be interactive. We'll have some videos. Please put in any questions you may have or even any um, thoughts like to add to the conversation as we go along. And um, so assumptions that, we, that some people have about you know, there's stereotypical assumptions of um, elders. And because of that, most of them don't want to express that they're sexually active or that they will be interested in sex because they don't want to be seen as being perverted or that they're living a luxurious lifestyle. Um, however, if we think about it, I feel like seniors are actually in the best position to be sexually um, active because, well, they have no work. They are, most of them are retired. Um, no kids, no like gym practice. They have to take someone to. They are the perfect stage in their life. Some people have lost a, a spouse. And so they're open to trying something new. Um, and so the, 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 the idea that sex in adults, in older adults is wrong is like a bias people have or we're trying to um, break down today. We also want to um, you know, address any biases people may have about the fact that older adults lose, lose the desire to have sex. They may have difficulty initiating, but they have the desire. Um, also want to bust the myth that uh, older adults can perform during sex. So you're going to watch a video that would let you see that you know, older adults are active and that older adults aren't sexually active, uh, attractive or also that they're too sick to have sex. So we're just gonna address these biases. And um, my next slide would show um, a poll, just a quick question is just so we can get our minds thinking and wondering how comfortable do you feel addressing sex and sexual intimacy with older adults um, in your family? you know, maybe people you serve in the community or even among, like even yourself, how comfortable do you feel addressing? We just want to get a sense of where everyone is so we can okay. see how we do at the end. Let me get it to about 50% and then we will share the results. Let's okay. see, get a few more there. Okay. All right, so here, I'll, I'll share the results with everybody. Can you see that? Yes, I can see it. So, I mean, I'm, I'm thankful people are honest. And, you know, from the poll, we can see that uh, very few people are somewhat comfortable. And we just have like 25%, which is like a quarter of the people here that are very comfortable addressing sex. And 14%, um, I mean, that's a good the fact that we don't have people who are very uncomfortable is great, which is probably probably because we have a lot of healthcare professionals here and somewhere along the line, you've probably learned a little bit about addressing um, you know, sex and intimacy. I would say from my own experience, um, you know, culturally, just because I'm from Nigeria, um, addressing sex and sexual intimacy in the past, especially with people um, you know, back home, was a little bit difficult um, for me. There was this bias, which I would think would be cultural, where there were just some things you didn't talk about with grandma, grandpa, or even my parents. Um, I also know that I've talked to a couple of my friends who are physicians, and even in their role and practice as physicians, if they're not directly um, dealing with geriatric patients, or they're not, they just feel like that's something else someone should be addressing. So we're going to learn more statistics as we go along about how physicians have even failed in addressing this and how we can help support um, seniors. So in our next slide is a video. We have a young Dr. James Habling who interviews some seniors about um, sex and aging. You know, you meet a 92-year-old Heather 
um, who started a new relationship. I think she's a firecracker. <laughs> and um, let's just see, it's a really short video, but I think it kind of helps us understand a little bit more about the topic. Sex advice in media is primarily targeted toward and written by young people, especially women. Why is this basic human act limited to such a select group? <clears throat> Arlene Heyman is a psychiatrist who wrote a book that focuses on sex among older people. She spent years investigating how aging is weirdly equated with asexuality. In so many areas of life, we turn to elders immediately and yet for sexual advice, that's not really on the table for a lot of people. There's a barrier between generations. You want to be involved sexually with people your own age, mm -hmm. and you're pushing off everybody. So people 15 years older, 20 years older are toxic, so you go with your cohort. There's clearly wisdom to be had from people who have had entire lifetimes of uh, lives that included sex, and yet this is an untapped gold mine. I set out to tap this gold mine. A lot of the relationship advice that is in media is in sort of the glossy magazines that are coming from people like me who don't have that much wisdom, so we're hoping to look to people who are a little bit further in life to reflect on what makes a relationship work. I really care about the person. I'm humanistic now where I wasn't before. So no games? No, no games. Just, just being myself. And they are then themselves and they tell me, oh, they haven't had a discussion like this in so long. We've discussed for two hours, three hours. This is, I wasn't like that when I was younger. I'm, I'm just an outgoing, which I always wasn't. But once it started, it was fun and it was easy. And so I continued. So be more outgoing. Yes, and you more, have to more sure of myself. Yeah. At the end of the day, the thing is communication. Keep that going. And as for the boudoir, well, mm, you got to keep that going too. Being inventive and open Being to new inventive. things. Being inventive. Oh yeah, get that pole. Dress up like a puppy, who cares? Clearly, there's a lot to be learned, not only in sustaining a relationship, but also starting a new one. Herta Weiss is 92 and just embarked on a new relationship after a 70-year marriage. You currently are seeing someone. Yes. And how did that come about? I was walking on the plaza, and a man came up to me and he said, is your name Herta? I said, yes, why? He said, well, I heard about you. Herta, heard about Herta. So <laughs> you probably get that a lot. <laughs> no, I do it myself. I'm such a nut. Before that, you were you were married for about 70, 80 years. Can I ask about physical intimacy? Sure. The role in a relationship as it progresses through the years. Yes, I had a wonderful relationship with my husband because uh, he was a lover, and uh, I mean I enjoyed it very much. With David, it's a little different. He's a little older. And he still wants to do the same things that a young guy does, but it's not that easy anymore. And I say to him, not today, next week. <laughs> but if a man is nice and talks to you in a nice way, then you enjoy being with that person and vice versa, you know, if it goes both ways. I would not give it up for anything. There's this idealized image of sex among the young, and then the young suffer terribly because they don't reach that idealized image at all. They worry how they're doing. It's all kinds of worries at all ages. You have one real advantage if you're aging with someone whom you care about, which is you're kind to each other, you know each other, mm -hmm. you know what will work, what will help, and you're less frightened to say, please do this, stop rubbing there, rub over here. That hurts. Slow down, yeah, if you keep rubbing me like this, my skin will come off. You're less afraid of being rejected for asking for what you want. And I think women in particular have a hard time asking for what they want. So the advice industry is exclusive and misleading, but there are experts all around us. And when you ask them about sex advice, 
They tend to tell you less about how to ace an oral sex exam and more about how to be a good person. Well, do you have any ad advice to my generation about approaching relationships? Yes, yes. What I think is very important is to make the woman what we used to call hot. Get into their life, make them feel great, to come, come away with something. This communication is the key all the time. To everything. To everything. Even the intimacy. Even, even intimacy. Do you have advice for your 33-year-old self about sex? Be kind. Be kind to whomever you're sleeping with. I would say to somebody like you, for instance, the girl, you know, you're so good looking, you're so sweet, and I really would love to have you in my arms right now. What do you say? Let's go and do something. And she'll say, no, I can't, I'm busy. Tomorrow I have to be, I'll get up at five in the morning, I can't. I said, well, it doesn't have to be now, but how about another time? This is what I would like, because I love you and you're beautiful. And if she says yes, and, if she, and, and then of course you can make a plan, but if she says, you know, I'm not for, for that. I'd like you, but I really, I'm not into that. Then you say, well, I'm sorry, but I need more than that. You let it go. Let it you go. Don't, don't let it go. It. Don't push it too much. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, Steve, I don't know if anyone has any comments about the video, um, but when I saw that video, to me, it was just like, hey, you know, um, old, older adults, are having sex, they have great ideas. Um, we could learn something from them and we could support them as well. So yeah, if not, then um, we can go on. Oh no, it was a great video, um, but uh, also a great reminder to the audience is feel free to just, as we approach these topics, you can ask questions, you can make comments, what have you. Um, yeah, great, great uh, thought provoking video, that's for sure. Okay. Um, so for people who like um, facts, there's some statistics. There's an NIH study that um, was conducted in 2017 that showed that at least 50% of the respondents and 78% uh, of women or who were respondents and 78% of the men, and they were all aged 75 to 85 years old, reported that they had an intimate um, sexual relationship. So it's, it's been studied because it's, um, you know, happening and just to let people know. So we're just demystifying the fact that people who are older, yes, they want to engage in sexual relationships. The study showed that um, older adults at least are engaging in uh, weekly in um, sexual, give me, sorry about that, in um, sexual activity, be it masturbating, um, oral intercourse, oral sex intercourse and even achieving orgasms. Um, they also studied the fact that like, you know, senior living communities kind of provide that room where people can meet each other and they promote sexual activity. So even though we're thinking that, you know, they're in a community, they're older, things are happening. And if we're um, members of um, people who work in a community, we can also not realize that people are engaging in relationships and let's see how we can help them promote healthy sexual lives, you know, prevent ST, STIs. Um, we also have found out two studies have shown that with the use of internet compared to back in the day, those are, that has also improved opportunities for people to meet their online dating sites. People can purchase sex toys discreetly, um, discreetly and even um, events that happen online as well, just to get people closer to each other. Um, a 2018 national poll on aging said that most adults are satisfied with their sex life. Like I put question marks there because you're like, really, they have a sex life? But yes, they do. Um, the University of Michigan um, poll showed that seniors aged 65 to 80 years, 60% of them were still having sex. Um, the romantic relationship rate rose to 54%. That even though more men, compared to women, um, they were still very much interested in sex. And that only a few of them actually admitted to talking to their physicians about their sex lives. And so my next slide is just really saying that, um, you know, we, we owe them, we owe seniors 
you know, support in, in ensuring that they have a great sex life and that they are doing this in a healthy form. And so I just have another question real quick. Do you have any biases towards seniors having, you know, um, sexuality, any, any bias at all that could prevent you from being supportive to a senior? Okay, so if everybody can take that poll that you see on the screen there. And try to get us up to about 50% and then I'll share the results. Oh, <laughs> yeah, uh, somebody, Steve Lawn said, uh, Ada, Ada, uh, we, uh, we needed no bias uh, on the poll. Um, no bias, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, really good. Uh, okay, and there's a lot of people that say no bias, but, but mm -hmm. let's, let's share these results here and understanding that we didn't have a no bias, uh, but, uh, but it's still very interesting. Yeah, okay, yeah, I, I would um, take note for next time, but that's true. I think um, the level of importance, the reason I put it was because I was guilty of that in my prior practice. I worked in an OBG, OBGYN clinic, and um, which the poll is showing as the 71% is that when we had seniors, females coming um, you know, to the GYN clinic, I feel like initially until we had a physician who came like two years before I left, that um, changed my perspective. I feel like we had the fact, we, we believed that, you know, there were more important things to worry about. You know, we're like, hey, does a person have endometrial cancer? Do they have, um, you know, cervical cancer? Do they have um, ovarian cancer? So when someone is coming in complaining of um, different issues, we were more concerned about the medical, you know, problems we felt like were the big issues. But in retrospect, and like I said, like two years before I left when we had a different person come in, it changed our perspective to realize that, you know, having a healthy sexual life would also impact their health you know, would help them go through whatever they were going through, even if it was cancer and you had someone who was supportive, who um, even though you didn't, maybe because you were too sick to have sex, but you were able to engage in some level of intimacy, that that helped. So um, my next slide is just describing um, physician failure in ad addressing sexuality in seniors. A, a June 2016 study showed that um, up almost like 63%, which is like a, a huge number of um, physicians from the study did not address sexuality in medical interviews. And 23% did it most of the time, but not all the time. And there were some reasons was like the lack of time, you know, they were really busy. They're trying to focus on the presenting, you know, symptom, not knowing that sometimes addressing this other part could help that symptom get better. You know, um, there was a fear of embarrassing the senior, there was a fear of um, being like being like they were being disrespectful to the senior, and most most importantly was the lack of technique. So I know it's something that GW is trying to do now, where they're trying to introduce more to their doctors and even um, um, students in different like medical allied um, sciences, the idea of like being able to address sexuality in seniors, not thinking that because seniors are older, they don't really know, you know, they don't have issues or the issues are of less concern. Um, so I know that if this study was done in physicians, the reason I brought it up and I asked the question, I should have put no, was just because I want us to think about ourselves as professionals in the health field and just saying, hey, are we able to help address this concern seniors may have um, and support them to leave, um, have a healthy sexual um, life. So um, we've, we've discussed, we've established that seniors are interested in sexual um, intimacy or even sex. We've established that there may be some bias. It could be, you know, like I said, lack of thinking that's important. Um, we've established that 
physicians and some professionals have failed seniors in addressing their sexual needs. But now I just want to discuss the things that we can address and support seniors who desire sexual intimacies into their 90s or even hundreds, right? So we know that um, with increasing age, um, sex becomes a little bit difficult. It doesn't mean that they don't want to have sex or they are asexual, like they're, they're not sexually attracted. It's just that something could, things could impede that desire. So for women, we have, we're addressing some changes in women. We have the fact that women experience vaginal dryness. Um, we also have the fact that their body changes and uh, which could also like, you know, feeling like, oh, I'm not as, as I used to be in my 20s, you know, breast changes. If they've had children, there may be some um, mid abdominal, um, you know, fat that, you know, might affect them. There's decrease in libido. As they get older, we have chronic disease, diseases like hypothyroidism. And so these are issues, but they can be managed. For instance, for vaginal dryness, you can use vaginal moisturizers like um, the one that is favored right now in the market, it's over the counter, is Replense. Um, you can apply it like three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, and it helps to rebuild the vaginal um, lining. Um, you can also use vaginal lubricants at the time of intercourse. Um, you know, you can use Astroglide. There's something called Joe's Sleek Quick. But one thing that um, OBGYNs prefer um, sometimes is uh, vaginal gel that is high in silicone. Um, those ones, you can't really find them over the counter in the drugstore, but you can find them in um, sex adults um, shops because the silicone helps it that it doesn't get um, easily, like it's not water-based. So it lasts longer and it could help during intercourse to alleviate pain. Um, you can also use oral estrogen and pain pills. That one is, you know, on the extreme cases, just because of the fear or worry of breast cancer or also like a stroke. So most times, very rarely do um, GYNs prescribe an um, oral estrogen. There's something called Osphener. It's been approved by the FDA. It's a, it's a low, very, very low dose, um, estrogen pill, but the physicians I talked to recently, just to get a sense of what they, how they felt with regards to using Osphener, said that they feel like it's still not something they will prescribe even though the FDA has approved it, just because they, they believe that it breaks down to byproducts of estrogen. And so they're also concerned. And you know, so that is something that if you're taking, if you're overweight, um, if, you're, if, you've have, if you have a family history of strokes, or family history of, you know, um, high blood pressure, all those kind of things, they'll be they'll be very wary to give you anything oral, just because it's more systemic in nature. And so, it, it, rather than that, they will prescribe a low dose estrogen cream, um, something called estrus or estradiol, zero point one milligram, which you can use for like three times a week, no longer than three to six months. Um, because at the same time too, they also are wary about estrogen, like additional estrogen. So what they usually prescribe if the vaginal uh, wall is really thin and dry is the estro estrogen pill, um, pills or cream, use it for a while, three to six months, and then they flip you over to replants, which is over the counter. So we can also um, use low dose um, testosterone as well. It's not like highly practiced for hormone replacement to increase libido for women. Um, they can also um, send you to a physical therapy. You can do Kegel exercises to help um, tighten the vaginal wall. And um, we also refer to sex therapists as well, just you know, to help as well, to help you know, create like new ideas on how to improve intimacy. And for men, men are, are not left out. So as men age, there's a decline in testosterone. Um, and that can also affect sexual function. Um, they need more, more stimulation to achieve and maintain erections or get to orgasm. Um, their orgasms are shorter. Um, you know, they need a longer time to achieve another erection. And I think it's just okay to let people know, hey, you're getting older. You may not, just like Heather said, you may not be able to do what you did when you were 30, 40, you know, 50s, 60s, but 
you can still enjoy intimacy, like they said, you know, there are other ways as well. So for men, we do the same thing as well. There's hormone replacement therapy to increase libido. Um, there are Kegel exercises in men as well that can help strengthen the genital urinary um, area as well. Um, we can also primary care visits because we, we know that in men, a lot of um, diseases could impact, I'll discuss that in the next slide, impact um, sexuality and um, sex. Um, you wanna rule out hypothyroidism um, most times just to make sure that that's not where the issue is coming from. We have counseling and also sex therapists. Um, Okay, um, so the, the next slide, we're talking about the psychology of sex and intimacy. Like I said um, before, is that some people, they, they feel less attractive. Uh, for others, you know, it takes time for them, you know, maturity for them to get to the point where they feel okay with who they are. Like we saw in the video where the seniors are saying, hey, before now I wasn't doing this, now I'm doing this. Um, and then also, the, the stress of exp expressing sexual, experiencing um, sexual difficulties could also now make you have sexual difficulties. So I feel like um, as, as we are able, let's support seniors, help them manage things that could affect their sexuality, grief, illness, lifestyle changes, money worries. So bringing supports um, to help with grief, you know, help them see the bright side of um, the situation helps with money uh, worries, bringing like, you know, people who can help them plan, um, people like um, Meryl, you know, to help plan so that they can now focus. So basically every encounter we have with seniors, let's try to address them holistically, not just focusing on the symptom, but trying to also ask about their sex life if they're willing and able to talk because we might be able to provide some support for them. So, explore sexual needs and promote health, healthy sexual habits for them. So with chronic illness and sexual activity, we know that diabetes um, can cause impotence. Oh, give me, sorry. We know that um, diabetes can cause impotence, high blood pressure impacts blood flow, hypothyroidism decreases libido. Um, you know, if you've had a heart attack before, you know, it's kind of something you, to watch. Be careful, make sure you're on your medications. Uh, we try to address genital urinary tract infections or incontinence. Um, breast cancer sometimes in men could affect, decrease, you know, their sex drive. So we want to address that as well. Um, even though people don't think it's common, sometimes men have breast cancer and it's, it's um, late before it's found out because our heads are not going to that direction. Atriotis, chronic pain, sex may be uncomfortable. Uh, comfortable. So it's just to find different, explore a different angle or different um, um, ways to do better. Treatments could also affect, um, you know, sexual performance as well. So, you, and medications as well. So uh, at the end of the day, I think this whole slide is trying to say, if you have chronic conditions, try to see your uh, primary care doctor. Don't, be, don't feel shy because sometimes they feel like they're trying to respect your privacy. Uh, they don't want to embarrass you. Um, so they don't want to discuss it, but if you be, feel empowered to talk about your, um, the, your um, sexual history and you know, what you would like to see and how they can help you. So the next slide is addressing cognitive impairment and sexual activity. While there are no laws or standards established to determine the abilities for people who have dementia to participate in sexual activity, the Alzheimer's Association just says that, you know, there's some, just some like, well, I say criteria, are they able to voluntarily participate? Are they able to say no verbally or non-verbally? Um, you want them to be safe from harm or exploitation, just because I know that we have um, some facilities where we have people who have dementia or even in our homes. Um, so what we've noticed with um, dementia or in cognitive issues is that as the diseases progress, there could be changes in sexual behavior. Some people have an inappropriate you know, or sexual you know, advances. Some people are aggressive sexually which may be due to loss of inhibition, depending on the part of the brain that is affected. Um, and, and some people can even have increased sex drive. 
you know, so we just have to monitor that and see how we can support them as well. Um, for people who have dementia too, or any cognitive impairment is that sometimes they may be unable to recognize a sexual partner, which could cause agitation for them. And then the partner could be suffering. So in that way, it's also to let the, provide the partner with um, support and let them see other ways they could be intimate with this, maybe rub, a feet, rub their feet, um, lay down together with them calmly, you know, um, just focus on um, pro, um, uh, I lost my train of thought, but focus on, instead of just thinking about sex, but focus on like, you know, pre, like just kissing, hugging, snuggling, just to get them to feel more comfortable, um, you know, so we need to kind of support them. And then for those um, people, family members or residents who behave inappropriately, we try not to overreact or express shock, understanding that it has to do with you know, the issues going on in the brain. Um, try to redirect them to another activity, something that they like to do that could distract them. Um, don't argue because arguing never works. They, they can't understand what you're saying. And um, if it's happening in a public place, um, try to maybe find somewhere you can get them into where, where they can be secluded, you know. So let's be sensitive to people um, who, who have um, brain issues and also still kind of have behave either inappropriately or, or their sexual needs are heightened. Let's find ways to support them as well. And that, those, those are um, where you can refer them to like mental health professionals that can support them and, and also support the fa family by providing um, activities that could help, help them redirect them. So this is a, a, a little video by Dr. Sheru Fraser, where she just describes responsive versus uh, spontaneous sexual activities and also kind of is a segue into kind of describing the benefits of um, sexuality and sexual intimacy. It's really short as well. Hello, I'm Dr. Cheryl Fraser. Welcome to this week's video, Love Bite. Today, I'm gonna to talk about a thorny topic for any of us in a human body, which is what do we do about the changes in sexuality that come along with getting older? Now, this is true at any age range, but where I most get this question is from people in their 40s and 50s and 60s. Now, whether you're in a male body or a female body, in your 50s, you're going to most likely notice some changes in your sexual functioning and your sexual desire. I'm going to briefly talk about them. This is a big topic, and I can do some longer teaching another time, but I just want to reassure you, first of all, you're normal. If, as you're getting a little bit older, or you've been in your relationship for a couple of decades, you have very little spontaneous sexual desire. What does that mean? It means you don't really feel like ripping your partner's clothes off all of a sudden. That tends to change over time, and one of the ways to fix that is to choose to be sexual, to create something called responsive sexual desire, which is in response to something you become turned on, not spontaneously, but in response to, well, I haven't made love to you in a few weeks and I miss you, I'm gonna choose to start kissing and touching you. Then my body responds, I get turned on. Or in response to, I know if we make love, I'm gonna feel close and cuddly and I'm gonna sleep better. So I'm gonna start to make love and touch you. Or in response to choosing to turn off the TV, get the, the, the shower really nice and hot and go have a lovely, luxurious, erotic shower together, then in response to that, the desire can be built. So. The topic of changes with sexuality as we age is a really big one, and I'll talk more about it in future Love Bites, but for today, I wanted to take that tiny little piece about the changes in desire, frankly, not wanting to make love very often. Even if you have a solo sexual life aside from your partner, meaning a masturbation life, you may not feel that turned on very often. You're normal, it's psychological, physiological, and it is changeable bit by bit by choosing to create circumstances, choosing to become lovers, choosing to be sexual, even if you're not necessarily in the mood. So there's a little taste of one of the things that happens as we age and one of the solutions for the issue of lower desire, lack of spontaneous sexual desire as we age. I'll be recording some more love bites on changes in our sexuality over the lifespan, sprinkling them through over the next 
few months, I look forward to sharing more with you right here in this forum. If this was useful, please share it. So like she said, um, there are health benefits for seniors. And like she recommends, you know, just do it. So you, they, they may not have the desire, but it's good to, when we have the opportunity to talk to them about the benefits of um, being, you know, sexually intimate. Um, so like she said as well, getting started could be the most difficult step, but once you get started, then it kind of sets the pace for the future. So with, with Australia for Women, with continuing like encouraging the um, or, um, seniors to have it, having sex increases lubrication with time. It a, 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 a increases vaginal elasticity, which increases, you know, makes it easier or less, less discomforting in the future. It releases oxytocin, both for men and women, who helps, and helps, which helps us to calm down, sleep better. It helps with pain management as well. Um, there's improved mood, people feel less alone, decreased isolation, improves um, you know, longevity as well. Uh, and um, some people even say, like some therapists say that you can consider sex like a workout. So, you know, for people who are not being out um, very active out there, at least, you know, having sex can help in that way where you're pumping more blood is flowing through the heart and, you know, it helps them as well to live better. So when, when we um, talk about um, sex is, uh, and sexuality in seniors, we're not just talking about the act of sex itself, but also intimacy. Um, so it's good to help seniors expand their definition of sex and intimacy. So it's not just, okay, if I have intercourse, then I have a great sex life, but as they age, depending on, you know, different physical um, conditions that may prevent actual sex, they can engage with just touching, kissing, like she was saying, um, holding. You can, uh, with time, that can, great, that can get to be a great way as well to release oxytocin and still help them feel better and feel connected. Um, as they age, um, it's normal to have like different needs. Um, abilities may change. So they sh um, seniors should be open to finding new ways and we should encourage them as well. Um, they, they can adapt your routine. Um, if you feel more energy in the morning, we can let them see, hey, you know, maybe morning may be better to support, you know, so your, your spouse doesn't feel or your partner doesn't feel alone. Um, Take more time to set stage for romance. Let's, let's encourage them as well. Um, try new positions. Um, don't give up on romance, basically. So no one outgrows the need for emotional connection and intimacy. And as they get older, it helps to reduce isolation and promote longevity. So we can't, we can't talk about sex and intimacy and not address STIs because even in seniors, um, STIs are a, a, a big problem. So the, there's an increase in STIs among seniors. And the reason is because most of them don't see themselves as a risk, you know, for getting STIs. They don't view themselves as being high risk. They don't, they don't see their, their um, partner as being high risk. They're still thinking it's the days of chivalry and knighthood where people were true to themselves. Um, they don't see the need to practice safe sex. Uh, they probably have been in a relationship for a long time. The person dies and they haven't really, they're not used to the new dating scene. They don't understand that maybe we have more, um, more men than women in the facility and everyone is trying to get something. So it's our role as healthcare professionals to um, help support them. So I have a couple of, um, you know, statistics on the screen from the CDC reporting increase in STIs among seniors. Um, chlamydia rose up by like 52%, which is a lot. Syphilis 65, gonorrhea 90. And so this, this historic, um, you know, highs in STIs and seniors is concerning. And some of the reasons that were shared is that there's inadequate access to STI um, testing in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. So that may be something you know, to consider to see if we can get uh, maybe doctors or you know, some form of testing. And also the fact that seniors you know, feel uncomfortable sharing that you know, their consent when they visit their doctors, they don't wanna be judged. So if we think or suspect 
that someone, a senior has an STI. Like if, some, if a senior comes to you with repeated UTIs, you may want to just kind of rule out an STI because they may not be saying what's going on, um, but that could be the issue as well. If um, you kind of see that you're uncomfortable, make them feel comfortable, you know, and try to support them. Discuss the fact that, you know, they should be insisting on, on condoms at least to prevent, um, you know, infections as well. So we want to educate, you know, and have public health campaigns, even in the facilities or wherever we find ourselves or whoever we find ourselves, we just let them know, hey, are you practicing safe sex? You know, maybe this is something you should look out for if you you're sexually active and you haven't practiced safe sex. Um, let's, um, if, if they can't use condoms, then let's uh, help them see the need to, to test regularly, you know, um, and also provide access to uh, STI testings in facilities or in nursing homes as well. So, Tips, some tips you can share with seniors is if they start a health, um, new relationship, they should use a condom, um, tell them to get tested annually or even more depending on number of partners they have, eat healthy, exercise regularly, uh, reduce alcohol and um, you know um, smoking just to help make sure they're healthy because the healthier you are, the easier it is to find some infections and let's provide support, no sex shaming. And we're rounding down and I think so summary is that sex in seniors is not a taboo. We should promote healthy sex practices in seniors. We should dissuade sex shaming in seniors. And um, however possible, let's just remember that seniors want to talk about sex. So they may not say, it, but we can help them so they can live healthier um, and have healthier sexual lives. And I think that's my, my final poll for today was if you've identified ways in which you can advocate for a senior's sexual um, well-being. And you can share those if you, have, if you say yes, maybe in your practice, in your family, or whichever way, um, you can just share it with us as well. So apart from saying yes, if you want to type it in and just, you know, or anything you kind of learned from this that, or anything you want to throw in to support the, the webinar today. Thank Great. you, Viv. Well, this is great. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that up there for a moment. And uh, we've got a few questions that have come in. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, uh, Jeannie says, embarrassment is not with seniors. It's with the families, kids, uh, and the kids. They have a hard time seeing this in their parents. Unfortunately, communication fails. As an <laughs> assisted living manager, Education and providing supplies on site helps training staff to respect their privacy. Really well said there. Uh, yes. Jeannie. Awesome. So, yeah, um, so she, she does address the fact that, which is something I hope that we've gotten, is the fact that the seniors aren't ashamed. If you ask them and if you're not like mocking them or trying to shame them, you can actually support them. So thank you, Jeannie, for reiterating that, that the, the box stops, stops with us, either as family members or as professionals to be able to, you know, get, get past our bias or barriers and reach out and support them. Great. And um, Amanda Max from the Providence, uh, one of our sponsors this, this month, in um, Fairfax, Virginia says, I'm wondering if there are any tips for conversing about sex with LGBTQ seniors. Um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, that's um, definitely a topic when we talk about um, it being challenging for some people to talk about, uh, that, that makes it even more challenging. Exactly. And I think even for the LGBTQT community, it's the same tips. It's first of all, overcoming your bias. And that's the reason for this presentation today. I don't know if Steve is able to share, but we can share the we can share this with people just because we want people to recognize that um, you know, seniors, they're they're just you 50, 60 years down the line. So if you are sexually active now, if you want to like, you know, how you hang out with your friends, where you're free, you can, that's them too. It's just that they're just older with gray hair or, you know, so, so the same way, I think it's just for us to understand the fact that they, they are just us and they would prefer that we talk to them, not about them. You know how sometimes people whisper, 
my God, they're holding hands mm-hmm. or did I hear noises? Like, so I think it's the same thing for LGBTQT. It's just people understand. So our role as professionals is to really educate our families, people we come across. Um, even, even when you're on a platform and someone is making a senior, senior joke, that is not like, you know, um, derogatory about like sex and seniors, you can, you can speak up and say, Hey, you know, I just, cause I do that personally. I, I, I don't laugh at everything. It could be funny, but I always want to re-educate and say, Hey, you know, so just little by little, you know, even if we're affecting that I, our little island, I think it has a ripple effect to educate people and just let them see that seniors are human, um, they they have the same needs that we have and we can support them as well. Yeah. Um, and let's see, on that topic of educating and changing the culture in our communities, Merrill says, why do nursing commu- uh, centers report sexual activity to families when both parties are in a re- relationship and are comfortable and in agreement with what they are doing? Um, I, I know that is a practice in some nursing centers. Um, any wow. thoughts on that? That's news to me. So I really, I don't know if someone who um, can help answer it is in the uh, audience, that'll be great because I don't know. I can research that. Why well, don't okay. you know about that? Yeah, yeah I've, heard of, I've heard about th- th- that occurring. That's surprising. Um, and uh, mm. um, definitely, you know, chime in on that. Um, Steve Lawn is um, piggybacking on Jeannie's statement in saying families have a hard time with their loved ones with dementia wanting to have sex. Mm-hmm. That, that just because they have cognitive issues that they, they shouldn't, how do you address this with families? Okay, so that's why I said that where there are no clear cut standards, if the, um, the association, Alzheimer's Association is saying that if the person has the ability to, to want sex and say so, and can say no, then they very well could, you know, because we don't want to step on that, their right to, you know, what they want. I think the concern is that sometimes because like they could want it at this point, but then afterwards, are they going to think that was I violated? You know, who is this stranger in my bed? So mm-hmm. if the whole family is in is aware and understands that, hey, mom wants sex with dad, but tomorrow she could forget, then at least we, we don't put that in a difficult spot as though he was being pervasive with mom, okay? So I feel in that situation, if the, if the person with dementia wants it and has said it and they have a partner who is willing, then hey, by no means let's help them because like I said, it helps decrease isolation, which, was, which is good for them and also helps with longevity as well. It can just help them feel it to be safer. So I think it's like a pick and choose. We, there's no clear cut like line because it's it's very fluid. The you know d- dementia and Alzheimer's they're all very fluid. So I think it's a uh, you know something you have to weigh as you go along. Great. And uh, Jeannie says it uh, makes a comment if the if the resident has dementia or if the family has authority such as guardianship, safety is the main concern. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Which is true. Um, great. Um, okay. Well, I've got, uh, of course, I was, I was saying I got through all the questions and Melissa has one here. There are local physical therapists and occupational therapists that specialize in women's health and have a plethora of resources for adaptive equipment if positioning and mobility are a challenge during sex for all genders. Wow. Great. Great Thank idea, and I think a great resource that probably most of us wouldn't really think about. But this is very much in align in alignment with living, and uh, therefore, you know, physical and occupational therapists uh, make a lot of sense. Yes, yes, which is something that you know, like I said, we can advocate for people. We can advocate for ourselves when we see our physicians. We can ask them to refer us. You know if they can help. So I feel like most times the reason people don't get help is because no one is really asking. You don't want them, you don't want them to think you're being luxurious, you're 70, 80, and you're still thinking. But I feel like, you know, hopefully we're changing the tide with the younger, um, you know, group of professionals that are coming where they can understand that sex is still a very, or sexual intimacy is still a very important part of seniors' lives. 
Yeah, the um, and I asked uh, Meryl to come back on the screen here. Um, uh, Meryl, yeah, there you go. Um, the uh, uh, Steve Lon says, who has a lot of experience in a variety of different elder care situations, says, in my experience, safety may be the community's main concern, but usually not the families. I think they're the family is more concerned with their discomfort with it rather than a loved one's safety. And, you know, I, I reflect on this topic. It's, and, and it's ironic, but there's, when it comes to sort of elder care decisions, there's two topics that families have a lot of difficulty talking about, but it's not just, it didn't just start now. It started early on in that family's history and that's sex and money. It's sort of yeah. like, most of the times we do not talk about sex with our um, uh, our family members, except for the birds and the bees talk. <laughs> and then with money, mm -hmm. like it, it's oftentimes taboo to talk about money with our families. And then all of a sudden we're in sort of an elder care retirement situation and the family's trying to figure out you know, what can mom afford? Where's the money? Where's the advanced directives? Where's mm -hmm. all that? So mm -hmm. I think communication really is a, um, a, a the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. And we need to just, because now as families, we're all adults, we can have adult conversations exactly. about sex and money. Um, and I but, think that for seniors, like couples who are in facilities, that's why sometimes the woman may not want the man to move to to memory care is because she wants someone that can hold her at night or mm -hmm. just be there. So understanding that they have that need and maybe trying to find ways to support them uh, while still maintaining safety, like Steve has talked about, Steve Land has talked about, you know, let's just consider it as well. Great. Well, uh, Adon, like this is, yeah, go ahead. I'd like to add something. I read a story about a man, an elderly man and woman who were living together for whatever reason, they didn't get married, but they in, were enjoying their life together. And the kids got together and separated the two. And the man died a lonely. He was so lonely that he died earlier than he should have. And the kids wound up getting more money because mm -hmm. he died earlier. And it's mm -hmm. very sad that money becomes such a, a problem uh, mm. because the kids in some cases want more and more and more and it hurts the seniors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why not let them enjoy their life as long as they can? They put in their time. Yep. Um, well, this has been great. Hey, uh, Meryl, I, uh, in, in an effort to uh, sort of wrap this up, we can continue this conversation but I'd like to open this up to sort of close out our meeting today with some networking. Would you, uh, how about if I bring everybody uh, in the audience, give them the opportunity to, to turn their cameras and mics on and we can kind of close things out with an open discussion? Is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah, well, okay. you know, we have it set to go till 10 a.m. So yeah, we're, so we're we not being intrusive on anybody's time who's here yeah. and involved. So what I'm going to do. For Thank you so much, Steve and Merle. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, you're welcome. Yeah, no, no worries. Uh, so what I'm going to do is um, I am going to um, I'm just I'm just giving folks permission to come on stage. OK, it's up to you if you want to turn your mic and, and camera on on. Um, so I'll leave that up to you. I know. Many of you may have not prepared for that. And uh, if you've got something to share, um, let us know. And uh, we can close this out with a um, uh, some face-to-face -face networking here. And someday we will uh, be back to having our meetings this way. Um, and Meryl, what's on tap? for next month for the Senior Service Alliance? Oh, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> I'm gonna have to look it up. There's one of, the, one of our other uh, 
members of the steering committee no <laughs> okay I'm, I'm hoping to folks if you can when i promote you to panelist you can accept okay all right i'm gonna go look that up right now okay. and i'll get back uh -oh. to you in a second i we have a master list and it looks like we're having um I'm trying to get you guys over here uh no one seems to be jumping over but um okay and uh yes Jeannie says how do i get a recording in the session i will um uh sorry um i'm just trying one at a time i'm sort of trying to give you guys permission to come over as panelists this may not be working today but um, I'm doing my best. Um, if we could get one of you over, I would feel a little bit more confident. We may have a technology issue on this one. Uh, so how about this? If anybody's got an announcement, raise your virtual hand and I will, I will at a minimum bring you on with voice while I'm trying to get folks up here. Okay, it looks like we're finally getting people over. Okay, there's Mark Ash. Hey, Never everybody. short of words, Mark. What is going thank, on? Thank you, uh, Dr. Ada. That's a, you made some some excellent points. Uh, it's great to see everyone. Mark Ash with Right at Home. Information in the chat. Um, you know, Dr. Ada, there's there's a, a, another point that that I've heard, and it's very. Um, you were you were relating to sexually uh, transmitted infections. And, and there's another point that I've heard that, that goes on in the senior buildings is sadly, some seniors to make ends meet are trading sexual favors for money or, 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 or something else. And, and that's another way that, 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 the, that the STIs are, 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 are spreading. Um, and also um, sometimes uh, on check day, when the seniors get their, their government checks, um, younger people who are there to uh, take advantage of them um, bring sexually transmitted infections into these senior buildings and then it's passed among the seniors. So these are things that we really have to be cognizant about and not be afraid to talk about uh, in our communities with our seniors and so on. And you made some great points about teaching them to protect themselves. It's never too late. And there's no one that's immune from it. Wow, well, that's, that's very interesting. I, I didn't, like, I don't have a lot of experience with um, senior communities, but like you said, I think we owe them, like whoever is, you know, in these facilities to, to support them, educate them. Because like you said, you know, STIs don't have a age limit, <laughs> you know, so interesting. Yeah, that uh, that could be uh, its own discussion there, Mark. That's uh, it doesn't surprise me, but it's uh, it's shocking that there could be situations like that. Um, well, I started in healthcare in uh, in the adult daycare industry in Baltimore, and the way we marketed our business, we went to senior buildings and we went door to door in in low income communities, and. I saw firsthand on the first and 15th of every month how every hoochie mama and hoochie papa were there trying to take advantage of the seniors when they were getting their checks. And, and it's, you know, um, it, it's terrible to see. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it never, we never want to see our seniors or our vulnerable people being taken, taken advantage of. Great. I agree with you, Mark. Uh, we've seen this cycle off and on, particularly with the homeless, hot spots like you know West Street in Annapolis, Laurel, hanging around the track under the bridge off Route One. A lot of these people have mental health issues in addition to being homeless, and they are prime targets, particularly when they go to the liquor stores that charge them an outrageous fee to cash those checks. And there have been so many different uh, civic groups and the police have been aware of this through their monthly uh, thing. And I don't know what the answer is because the liquor board doesn't seem to be 
hitting them where it hurts in the wallet. Wow. I don't know what the answer is with that cycle, but it is a shame, but you're absolutely right. This could be its own discussion. Um, I, I thank you all for bringing that to everybody's awareness. Does anybody else have anything, Meryl? August 21st, the speaker for Senior Services Alliance will be Liz Johnson. She is a senior herself. She has quite a background in marketing. She was part of the uh, corporate world. Now she has a very successful uh, small business herself. And she's gonna talk to all of our vendors, all of us as vendors and how we can market our businesses further. And then on September 14th, our speaker is Jan Brito and Laura Quigley. And what they're gonna bring to us is um, as a realtor, there's a short, like a weekend program that, real, that realtors take and they can get this certificate of, for being given permission to that they understand seniors uh, even better. There is now a program which takes a year to complete. And they are at the end of completing this very specialized program in dealing with the real estate market and interacting with seniors. So those are our next two presentations. Great, and I found the, uh, the link to all of your meetings and threw that into chat as well. Hey, Mark, um, Steve, I just wanted to say hi, Jim Bland. Hello, Ida, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, good to see you. Good and to Mark see too. you. <laughs> and the presentation, that was excellent. Um, thank you. Hi, this is Fred Young from Crozet, Virginia. Uh, have a solo practice. And at a, if I can call you on first name basis, first of all, wonderful presentation set of information and all of you uh, about a subject, two observations and a question. Um, the two observations are one, this is the most number of males that I've seen, Steve, on any recent webinars, <laughs> I can mainly women. So that's interesting curiosity. <laughs> there are so many men on this. Um, and then second observation is while Sexuality and finance may be the two topics that people are most uncomfortable with dealing in aging. Finance gets talked about a lot. There are a lot of seminars. There's a lot of information out there about finance, but very little about sexuality. Mm -hmm. So I find that curious. And again, a uh, topic of interest. The question that I have is I, as a solo practitioner, I have both individuals that I work with and they're aging and there's a fair bit of dementia involved. Um, and I've got individuals and then I have couples. I wanted to check that when I'm working with individuals, it's typically a one-on-one -on -one counseling session that I would have, or otherwise I kind of use my judgment in terms of if I want to discuss sexuality with a couple individually, with each one separately versus discussing it with them together. And I probably would use my judgment if I see that they have a caring, loving relationship, I might consider bringing up the topic and seeing if they even want to talk about it and just say, hey, you know, um, you know, are you comfortable talking about sexuality? Is that that's part of my assessment, but we also don't necessarily need to talk about it, feel them out. But otherwise, not if I sense that there's some tension or something like that between a couple that they're not that close, I would choose then to talk with them separately. And not only about sexuality, it could just be to talk with them separately. And I wanted to get your expert advice on that in terms of is that an appropriate approach to address that when you're doing assessments of the elderly and particularly with dementia? I think you're spot on. I couldn't have said it better. I feel like our judgment and because you've been in the industry for a while and you probably have like a high emotional intelligence, you're able to gauge. And I think that's that's really like a great way to do it because if they're not in sync and you bring it up, it's gonna go nowhere, <laughs> you know, if they're together. <laughs> but if they're separate, then you can kind of get where one person is, where the other person is, and then see if there's a middle ground. Sometimes, unfortunately, there may be no middle ground. So you will just have to support each of them where they are and see, you know, pray that God helps them some way. But if they're together and in sync, then yes, definitely, because it would be to their advantage to hear it together from a neutral party, you know? Perfect. So it, and I, that's really awesome. Like you said, you know, it's something that I feel like we owe it to them to help support just because, like I said, it helps improve longevity, helps them feel better, manages pain. 
So, you know, and, and, and also letting them see that, hey, it doesn't always have to be like the lady in the first video said, it's not just about the boudoir. I don't know what that lang what language that is, but it's just about the connection, the, the, you know, the feelings of I'm not alone, you know? So there are other ways you can just hold hands, you can be together, you can pull a song from back in the day that you liked, you know? You can just set the mood and that's okay, you know? So great job. Thank you for the I question. Think. Any other questions, comments, discussion topics, uh, events that you guys might have coming yeah, I up? I want to say that I'm looking to hire care managers. <laughs> so if you know anyone, send them my way, nurses or social workers, you know, part-time, you know, whatever. Thank you. I can only do long distance work, but I can do it telephonically in Zoom if folks are interested. <laughs> You know, we've had people ask us if we were going to go back to meeting live in, a, in a, you know, one-to-one. -one. We used to meet at Brightview Falls Grove. And uh, because we've grown so much and we've expanded so much that it appears that we would wind up hurting ourselves if we went back to the intimacy of a live meeting. And um, the quality of the people who are coming on to our meetings, we would lose them. So I think being virtual is how we're going to stay. And I think everybody can understand the importance of putting your chat, your inform communication information in the chat so that um, if somebody knows they need to find information that, and somebody has that field as part of their career, um, they feel comfortable contacting them. And we're always looking for uh, speakers to add to our list. So if you know somebody that has a topic that would be of interest to uh, the senior community, senior vendors, uh, please contact myself, Joe, uh, Gary, or Aaron. We're more than glad to talk to you. So thank you. Um, I'm just tickled pink to see how many people came on board to uh, this presentation. I figured it would be a topic of interest. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Yes. All right, guys. Well, should we do sort of a last call here? If uh, the um, any additional questions, comments, uh, and if you'd like to make an announcement, if you got something going on, um, let's see. Rebecca, it looks like your hand is raised. Yes, I am. Um joined late and would like to get uh, access to the recording if that's possible. I don't, I didn't hear the answer of how we do that. Yeah, I will um, send, I'll upload that and I'll send it to um, the Senior Services Alliance team. I'll also put it on our website at proaging.com so that folks can view the recording. Thank you so much. All right. And let's see. I could add one more thing as that yep. if, if and people are already doing this is continue to spread the word about the quality of pro-aging source book and senior services alliance. We both feel uh, the more the merrier and you know professional people always have something good to say. Right. Thank, thanks, thank Meryl. you. And then, uh, Jim, I think you, you got your virtual hand raised there. Yes, thank you, Steve. I, I just wanted to make sure, will you be uh, sending a copy of the chat out to everyone as well, or do we need to individually? I, I can definitely do that. That's okay, great. great. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay, guys. Well, thank you. Let's uh, get our day started then. Great Steve. job. Thank yep. you. Steve, I'd like to thank you Have a great week. for all the coordination you've done in piecing this together um it just has made us all look better so. <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. and adopt it. it goes Adop. without saying 
You're great the best. Job. Thank you. Have All a right. great week. Hey, Rest Steve, week. you have a Thank quick you. second you I can call you? Uh, sure. Yeah. Do you have my cell phone? I do. Okay, yep. great. Thanks. Okay. Bye. See you, See you guys. Okay. Bye.